Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this paper. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I'm currently a fifth year PhD student at Princeton University. And um, today I'm going to be presenting this paper that uh, is work with Gene Grossman and Elhan and Helpman, who are also in the audience on resilience in vertical supply chains. So as we all know, supply chain disruptions have become the new normal or the new abnormal. We've been experiencing a lot of supply chain disruptions, particularly since the COVID-19 pandemic. And because of you know, issues like climate change or increased geopolitical risk, we worry that we're going to start experiencing more frequent supply chain disruptions. So I think it's fair to say that public attention has started to focus on what we can do about supply chain resilience. Um, and uh, when I say public attention, I mean international organizations, national governments, think tanks, etc. So the main big picture <clears throat> theme of this paper is precisely what can we do about it? And I think the first thing that is natural to ask ourselves is what are firms' private incentives to invest in the resiliency of their supply chains? And in order to understand private incentives for investment in resilience, we of course first have to define what we mean by resilience. In this paper, we're going to take a stance and uh, let resilience be one of two things, either investments in redundancy or redundant supplier relationships or link formation or investments in agility. So a firm can invest in redundant relationships, of course, so that if one of their suppliers fails, they can still source their inputs from other suppliers, but they can also invest in agility, which is just in our model going to be any investment in any technology that simply reduces the risk of a catastrophic disruption to the firm's operations. Okay. As economists, of course, we're also interested to see, uh, interested in seeing whether government can actually play a role in improving the resiliency of supply chains. And for this, of course, there have to be externalities or market failures that the government can correct. A lot of the policy literature has stressed that some of the biggest inefficiencies in supply chains might be coming from the most upstream sectors of the economy. In this paper, we're actually going to be providing a couple of reasons uh, that might justify that the government should uh, subsidize investments in resilience more in the more upstream sectors of the economy relative to the downstream sectors of the economy. Okay. So what are the questions that we address in this paper. The first question that we address is precisely what are the relevant ex externalities in a canonical model of vertical supply chains? There are many potential externalities in a production network. When you invest in resilience, this is going to affect your buyers, of course. It's also going to affect your suppliers. And there are many possible equilibrium results from these investments. Second, we're, we ask ourselves, what are the market distortions? Okay. And this is a good segue to trying to understand what are the optimal policies. And in particular, how these policies are going to vary along the supply chain. Do we want to subsidize more in the more upstream sectors or do we want to subsidize more in the more downstream sectors? Might there be a reason to tax or is there overinvestment in resilience? So these are the kinds of questions that we want to uh, tackle in this paper. And of course, we want to ask, you know, how do first best policies for agility and link formation differ from second best policies? And at this point, I'm not going to be very precise still uh, by, by what I mean by second best policies, but this will become much clearer by the end of the talk. So the main contribution of this paper is to provide a novel model of vertical supply chains that can allow us to actually study optimal policy, which we think is a first order question in a, in a very complex setting. So the model is going to feature an arbitrary number, capital S plus one of production tiers, where firms in tier S are going to purchase their inputs from their suppliers in the immediately upstream tier, tier S minus one. So we're going to have this snake structure in the in the vertical supply chain. But we also recognize the fact that firms can supply, can buy inputs from many po uh, potential suppliers, and they can also sell their input to many potential customers. So we're going to assume that firms can do this, okay? And we think this is reasonable also in light of some of the uh, policy papers that inspired this paper, where, you know, for example, firms like Apple or General Motors have many suppliers that themselves have in the hundreds, that themselves have many, many different suppliers, also in the hundreds or thousands. And to study uh, vertical supply chains, one of the challenges is studying how quantities and prices are going to be determined in the supply chain. And here we're going to propose a solution concept, which we term na uh, sequential Nash and Nash bargaining, which consists of the following. It's going to be sequential because we're going to assume that firms that are more downstream, final goods producers, are going to be the first 
to start negotiations with their immediately upstream suppliers in tier capital S minus one. They're going to negotiate over quantities and transfers, anticipating the effect that these negotiations over these contracts is going to have on subsequent negotiations further upstream in the supply chain. Once firms in tier capital S and firms in tier capital S minus one negotiate these contracts, negotiations between firms in capital and tier capital S minus one and tier capital S minus two will begin and so on and so on until we reach negotiations between firms in tier one and firms in tier zero. So this is a sequential part of the solution concept. Then we also have <clears throat> the Nash and Nash part of the solution concept, which we need precisely because we're assuming that firms have many suppliers and many buyers. Right? So what the, this assumption the solution concept consists of is saying when it comes the time for a firm in tier S to negotiate with its supplier in tier S minus one, the buyer is going to be taking as given all the other negotiations it is simultaneously undertaken with all of its other suppliers. And the supplier will be taking as given all the other negotiations it is simultaneously undertaking with all of its other buyers. And we think this is reasonable, again, in light of all the many negotiations that take place and therefore the difficulty of actually having a very large and efficient bargain. Okay. Finally, of course, we want to study endogenous network formation and endogenous investments in agility. So we're going to allow for this, okay? And we're going to allow for independent risks of catastrophic supply chain disruption. We still have to talk over some of the additional model, uh, um, modeling assumptions that we make. So let's first discuss the timing of the assumptions, the timing assumption, sorry. So firms are first going to invest in agility and in link formation. So they're going to incur labor costs okay, in order to invest in having more links or to invest in this technology that is going to make them less likely to suffer a catastrophic disruption to their operations. After this, disruption shocks are going to become realized and they're going to determine what, what is the set of surviving firms in the supply chain. And amongst these surviving firms, we're going to have the sequential Nash and Nash part. So again, the most downstream firms in tier capital S will begin negotiations with their immediately upstream suppliers in tier capital S minus one, and so on and so on until we reach negotiations between firms in tier one and firms in tier zero. Finally, firms are going to hire labor. They're going to manufacture intermediate inputs and fulfill their contracts in all tiers. <clears throat> and final goods producers will do the same sell their output to consumers who will consume this output. Okay. Now, some additional assumptions that we make are about the production technology in each tier. We're going to assume that it's going, going to be Cobb Douglas across two nests, labor, and the bargain tier S minus one intermediate inputs. These bargain tier S minus one intermediate inputs will consist of a CES bundle of such inputs. Okay. The exception, of course, is going to be in tier zero, where because there's no further upstream inputs, firms are just going to produce according to a linear production function in labor. Demand is going to be derived from CS aggregate preferences over the differentiated final goods. And then again, there's these two uh, endogenous decisions undertaking ex ante, the ex ante investment in agility. So if the firm decides to invest RS units of labor, this will lead to a survival probability given by phi s of rs, where phi s is a function that can depend on the tier, and also this ex ante investment in link formation. So if the firm invests more units of labor, it will be able to match with more firms ex ante, with more upstream firms ex ante. I think I also want to highlight the fact that these are two very economically distinct decisions. Just for example, okay, so one of the main, I think, distinctions that we have to make between these two economic choices is the fact that when you invest in having more upstream suppliers, this is actually going to affect your bargaining position ex post. If you're a firm that has more upstream suppliers, this is going to make you more attractive to your buyers because you're going to have more suppliers, you're going to be more diversified and be lower cost. But it's also going to make you, but if you're, but as a, as a buyer, it's also going to allow you to have a larger bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis your suppliers. Whereas, of course, investment in agility has no effect on your ex post bargaining position. It's just going to affect your survival, probabil your survival probability, but conditional on surviving is not going to affect your bargaining position. Finally, we're also going to 
uh, have a labor mar market clearing condition that is going to allow us to solve for the general equilibrium of this economy. Labor, um, as we've discussed, is going to be used for the production of intermediate inputs, for the production of final goods, and also, as I've just discussed, uh, for investments in agility and links. Okay. So now I think we can discuss one of the key model results, which is that we show that the sequential Nash and Nash solution concept is going to yield an intuitive and very tractable solution for negotiated transfers and quantities, which we need if we want to study optimal policy in these supply chains, right? <clears throat> and um, this uh, recursive solution we show is characterized very readily by a markup factor. And this markup factor is basically telling us how much a firm in tier S minus one, a supplier in tier S minus one, is going to charge each of its buyers for its input in tier S. Okay. And what is this markup factor? It's a weighted average of one and the Dixit Stiglitz markups of sigma S over sigma S minus one. So this is the key result of the model. If the buyer has all the bargaining power, then it will be charged no markup. But if the supplier that it's currently negotiating with has all the bilateral bargaining power, then the supplier will be able to charge a monopoly markup of sigma s over sigma s minus one, where just to be clear, sigma s is the elasticity of substitution perceived by buyers across all their tier s minus one suppliers. So if buyers perceive inputs to be more highly differentiated, sellers will of course be able to charge a higher markup. So we think this is a very intuitive result and it's going to allow us to characterize very uh, neatly the solution to this bargaining problem in vertical supply chains. So now we're ready to discuss the objective if, if we want of the paper, which is optimal policy. So <clears throat> the first set of policies that we study are the first best policies that the social planner needs in order to decentralize the first best allocation. We show that in general, the social planner is going to need three sets of policies. It's going to need taxes or subsidies on input transactions, taxes or subsidies on investment in agility, and taxes or subsidies on investment in link formation. These taus, thetas, and bar thetas are just numbers that are positive. If they're smaller than one, they're going to denote a subsidy, and if they're larger than one, they're going to denote a tax. So let's discuss the key results for the first best case. So the first thing that we find, perhaps the least surprising result in this setting, is that the government will not want to subsidize nor tax purchases of final goods. This is because in this one sector model, the consumption this, there's no consumption distortion created by this Dixit Stiglitz markups in the final goods sector. The other, the, the next result that we find is that the, um, the, the government we also not want to implement any subsidy on purchases of tier zero inputs. And to understand this, perhaps it's easier to first understand why the government does want to implement subsidies on purchases of intermediate inputs in the middle of the chain. To understand this, remember the markup factor that I discussed in the previous slide. When a firm in tier S negotiates with its supplier in tier S minus one, they anticipate that the tier S minus one firm is going to be also charged a markup factor by its tier S minus two supplier. And because of this, the private cost that firms perceive for the tier S minus one input does not coincide with the social cost. And this is why the government wants to intervene to implement a subsidy so that uh, the, the, the efficient amount is transacted. So why, again, is there no subsidy in tier zero? Well, because when a tier one firm negotiates with a tier zero supplier, the private cost will coincide with the social cost because there's no further negotiation between a tier zero supplier and subsequent upstream suppliers. There's nothing upstream from tier zero. Okay. So these are the first best um, policies on input transactions. What about the policies on resilience? Okay. So when it comes to agility, we find that in tier zero, the government wants to subsidize. So in the most upstream sector, the government wants to subsidize investments in agility. What about policy for investments in agility and link formation in the middle of the chain. Here we find, I want to say two or three very surprising uh, surprising results. First of all, we find that investments in agility okay, are going to coincide, sorry, subsidies on agility are going to coincide with subsidies on link formation. Okay, even though as we discussed earlier, these are very economically distinct choices. 
Second, in the first best case, we find that in general, the optimal policy on, on, on the optimal policy on investments in resilience and agility is going to depend only on, on production function and bargaining parameters of that tier. Okay. Then let's discuss what this policy is. So what we see in the numerator is that on the one hand, firms tend to underinvest in agility and link formation because they don't internalize the fact that when they invest in agility and link formation, this is going to have positive externalities on their buyers, particularly, particularly their immediately downstream buyers. But at the same time, in this first best case, when the government is subsidizing input transactions, it's blowing up firms' profitability, which is leading them to, in general, overinvest in resilience. So the government wants to correct for its policy on input transactions. Okay? So this is why, in general, we're not going to be able to sign whether it's this policy or, or to say whether it's a subsidy or a tax. It depends on which effect dominates. Okay? What we can say is that if bargaining parameters are the same across all tiers in the supply chain, and if inputs become more differentiated as we go downstream, then agility and link formation subsidies are going to decrease as we go downstream. Or another way of saying this, they're going to increase as we go upstream. And here, this is coming exclusively from the subsidies on input transactions, which we just said they're going to be higher okay, in the most downstream sectors because there's a greater inefficiency stemming from greater differentiation of inputs. Okay? And because the government is subsidizing input transactions more, it's going to have to subsidize investment in resilience less. Okay. So this is the, the the lesson from for the first from the first best case. So what about the second best case? So let's be precise by what we mean by the second best case. <clears throat> After all, this is a paper about studying inefficiencies and in investments in in resilience. So we thought that it was it was you know an an important case to study was a case in which we restrict the government not to implement any policy on input transactions. Okay, so tau s in this case is going to be equal to one in all tiers of the production chain. And what we find in this case is that now the information that enters the design of these policies is going to be substantially different to that from the first best case. So the numerator still remains. Firms tend to underinvest in resilience and link formation, sorry, in agility and link formation because they don't internalize that their decision has an, an externality on their downstream buyers. But now, because the government is not correcting the consumption distortions in this supply chain, there's also going to be this accumulation of downstream conditions from uh, firm S. Okay? So because throughout the entire supply chain, firms are under transacting, they're under purchasing inputs, this is going to accumulate until we reach tier S. The more upstream we go, the more severe this issue of accumulation of markups is going to be, or let's say accumulation of consumption distortions. Okay, so here in this case, also notice that because optimal policy is going to depend on all of this accumulation of markups, the government would need much more information. In particular, it's going to need it's going to need information about the structure of the entire supply chain to design the particular policy for a given tier. Okay. Moreover, in general, we cannot also sign this policy in this case. We already discussed that both the one minus beta s plus one and this product in the denominator seem to suggest that we have to subsidize investments in, in resilience. But now, because the government is not correcting for, um, for these uh, consumption distortions, <clears throat> there appears this general equilibrium term given by J. Okay? And this general equilibrium term, what it's saying intuitively is that when there's more consumption distortions, firms are producing less, they're therefore demanding less labor. And then in general equilibrium, this means that the value of their sales relative to the price of labor is going to increase. Okay? And so it, it attenuates the need for subsidies on resilience, the general equilibrium. Okay? So just to recap, to give some intuition, we show that second best policies <clears throat> increase with markups and, in and input shares downstream from S, since markups are going to reduce downstream sales and profits and depress the incentives to invest. Of course, just by looking at this expression, it's easy to see that if the bargaining parameters are the same across all tiers, second best resilient subsidies are going to be larger upstream. This is coming from this accumulation of uh, 
of um, consumption distortions that I discussed uh, just now. Another way of seeing this is that upstream firms create positive externalities for more downstream firms than further downstream firms. And finally, I also wanted to point out that just as in the first best case, we find that second best link subsidies are the same as the second best agility subsidies. Okay. So I'm going to conclude now and say that I think this is a, a an exciting uh, uh, paper. We basically designed a new model of vertical supply chains with multiple tiers, endogenous networks, endogenous agility, bilateral and sequential bargaining in general equilibrium that can allow us to study what we think are extremely important questions of optimal policy in supply chains. We showed that bilateral bargaining with shared surplus generates private cost of inputs that is greater than social cost. And this is precisely what motivates why the government intervenes in the first best case by designing input transaction subsidies that offset the effect of these markups on perceived costs. And we find that in the second best case in which the government does not implement input transaction subsidies, the second best policy on investments in resilience is going to depend on this, ac this accumulation of downstream conditions. Finally, we showed that for different reasons, but under reasonable conditions on bargaining and production function parameters, first and second best agility and link subsidies are larger upstream. In the first best case, it had to do with the interaction of these policies with the uh, first best input transaction subsidies and the fact that these are going to be larger in the more downstream sectors, provided that uh, inputs are more dif differentiated downstream than upstream. And in the second best case, they were larger because of this accumulation of um, consumption distortions. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this paper.